Hey friends, Dr. Harry Caritas here from the Menace Rev, and I have got a fantastic show for you this week. This is the one show that I've been looking forward to do for the longest time, because as you guys know, I'm an emergency physician, and who I have with you today is someone who's cut from the same kind of cloth as Elizabeth Cantu. She's a certified professional coach. She's an emergency, emergency room registered nurse of 16 years. She's serving emergency room nurses and first responders to have inner peace loving relationships, and have a life living on purpose, which I absolutely love. She found herself disconnected on the verge of total burnout due, due to busy long shifts and holding in the sadness and lack of support at work to process traumatic arrests and dying patients. The inability to say no and set boundaries with her family, friends, and supervisors left her feeling resentful and exhausted with nothing left over for self-care, family, and friends. She had difficulty relaxing due to her constant busy body and fast-paced, adrenaline-filled work environment. Attaching the need to help others as nurses, as a nurse, she felt her only purpose. Now she understands that letting go of old stories and trauma, per permitting herself to set boundaries and using all the tools and ex years of experience as a trauma nurse has helped her find her true purpose to coach and empower others. So please welcome me in joining Elizabeth Cantu. Elizabeth, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Harry. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here with you today. You know, I am I am so excited because we've got a bunch to talk about today, especially in the world of emergency medicine, which we both come from. And I think we share a lot of the same in regards to um, our backgrounds and our in our journeys. Um, and I know a, a little bit about your journey because we know we've known each other for, for, for some time now, but tell us, tell us and the listeners about your journey and specifically your inflection point. That's really what we love to talk about here is our people's inflection point, their pivot point where they took themselves from where they were to now to where they are. So Elizabeth, go ahead and tell us what it tells a little bit about that. Okay. Thank you very much, Harry. You know, um, Emergency room nursing has always been something that I loved, and it was, I began my journey in healthcare from a very young age. I actually was a trauma tech. Uh, I actually started out as CNA, hated mm. that job because I worked in an Alzheimer's facility, yeah. and I just remember being so sad every time I left there, and <laughs> I thought, this, this, this is not for me. I need something that's more, you know, fast-paced, challenging, and I went down to the ER and begged for the job, and the director, you know, she... Well, she loved my energy and, and uh, gave me a chance. And, you know, as well as I do, we don't hire CNAs in the ER. So yeah. they hired me in that role to be at ER tech. And it just kind of started from there. Every, you know, every, um, every step I went back to become an LVN and then back to become an RN. And I spent a majority of my time. I mean, I grew up in the ER pretty much, you know, from tech to LVN and then RN. So I've spent more than 16 years in that field. And one thing that I realized was there wasn't really a lot of support for us. I was seeing all of these really traumatic uh, death and, and dying and, you know, helping the coroner after we had a coroner's case come in and take pictures of our trauma patients or um, even, you know, victims that would come in if there were a coroner's case. And, but we never talked about it. You know, all we did was really just laugh and joke about things. And um, it started to weigh on me, honestly. I felt like I started coming home and I wasn't really able to talk to my husband or connect with him because he was working in optometry. And here I come, you know, we're working at the same, same hospital, but I come home and I have the super long shifts and I just, I wasn't able to connect with him. I wanted to talk to him about things because we didn't have the support at work. And anytime we brought something up or I would tear up whenever there was a pediatric trauma or just whatever. I mean, it, people, I know that it's part of our job, but being human beings, we're going to get sad when certain cases come up. And, you know, anytime you cry, everybody's making fun of you, teasing mm -hmm. you for being sensitive. And, um, quite frankly, I'd come home and my husband didn't know how to, he didn't know how to hold space for me. And so that actually started causing problems in our marriage. And I found myself actually running to work more so that I could avoid my feelings mm. and working, picking up more shifts 
and just really becoming disconnected from myself and who I who I was in the first place, a very kind, caring, loving, and compassionate person, I started finding myself getting really annoyed with people when yeah. they would come into the ER. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, this is not at all who I became. This is not, this is not me. This is not why I started my journey. And um, unfortunately, you know, my, the, the turning point for me was when my marriage ended. And that was a big wake up call. Big yeah. wake up call for me. You know, you, you said something. We, we share a similar story in that, um, you know, being in the ER, we do see a lot of trauma and a lot of death. And that was really my inflection point was when I had a pediatric cardiac arrest many years ago. But I think one thing that that struck me in what you had said is you had come home to want to speak with your significant other. That was completely the opposite for me. Um, I had come home with that after my pediatric arrest that ultimately died. I, I came home and I had that sense of, I didn't want to talk to my, to my wife, who I absolutely adore. She's so loving. She's so wonderful. I've got two great kids, but I just didn't want to burden them. I didn't want to burden them with my day. So the last thing I wanted to do was to, to talk to, to her um, about it, which is, is a problem is a red flag because they are, par- you know, your partners with, um, with your significant other. And that's really what I found as a turning point for me. So I appreciate you sharing that because I know many others are like that too, where they need to speak with somebody or somebody close to them, be them significant other or mm-hmm. a colleague. And what I've been noticing, Elizabeth, especially in our world, especially in emergency medicine, especially frontliners, as we're called, I guess, nowadays, or critical care specialists, is many of us suffer in, in solitude um, because either they, they don't want to share that burden or the challenges with somebody else, or that they do, but they don't know who to talk to. Uh, because, and please tell me if you can relate to this as well, because what I have found is the people who I can relate to about some of the struggles I was having at work are my colleagues at work, but I also didn't want to tell them about this either because I didn't want to feel uh, like I wasn't cut out to do it. I wasn't, um, you know, I wasn't cut out to be an emergency physician more. I was an imposter perhaps. Mm-hmm. And you touched on that just a little while ago as, you know, when you were, you know, tearful in the ED after a death or a trauma, you know, you were made fun of. And I think that's a, 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 a something that we're definitely seeing in emergency medicine, especially, but in medicine too. So tell us a little bit about why do you think that is, Elizabeth? Why do you think we struggle to share our feelings with our colleagues? I understand maybe, maybe with our colleagues, but I don't know why. What do you think is the reason why we struggle so much to share some of our challenges with our colleagues at work? Yeah. Well, you know, um, that's a great question, Harry. And, and I believe that there is this a certain persona, you know, you have to almost show up as a different person when you come to work so you can handle all these challenges that come with, um, you know, the, the unknown, <laughs> the yeah. unknown that is happening at work. You never know what's coming in through the door. So I think that a lot of people get into this, I call it nurse mode or like doctor mode, where you're in that mode, where you've almost like, you just put on a whole different person so that you can handle what's walking through the door. And sometimes if people digress from that and they start speaking a little bit more like connecting emotionally or holding space for other people, maybe they're afraid that they won't be able to get out of that space or that people are gonna look at them like they're weak because we have to have a certain composure to ourselves right so if bed five has just we just called the code and now we have to put this patient in a body bag and tag them and wait for the mortuary or the coroner to come pick them up and then bed six is a new chest pain that's coming acls and then you have you know bed three who's this old lady who this little old lady who uh you know tripped and fell you have to be present to the patient that's coming ACLS and then you have to be present to this old lady and their family that's coming in so 
it's like there's not really time to be compassionate for each other because we need we have a job to do and so somebody might look at you and say "Mm, okay you know that this is the job that we have why don't you wait till later and we can talk about that or we just don't have time to talk about that right now or people might look at you like you are weak if that you can't like you said handle the job but it's it's not true i mean we have emotions that are we're normal human beings and have emotions when we see death and dying. And so, but in an instant, we have to change what we just saw. We cannot, you know, okay, this person has passed away. That's, that's what it is. We got to close that chart out. We got to call the coroner and then we got to get over here to be ready for the ACLS that's coming. Yeah. We've also been seeing though, Elizabeth, the, the, the repercussions of that in, in just these past, several months, we've had several um, either either nurses or physicians or other folks in healthcare uh, commit suicide. Yeah. And we need to talk about that as well, too. I know you wanted to speak a little bit about that, too. Tell us a little bit about what are your thoughts, because it was from your home state of California. Yeah, both of the nurses. Yeah. So in January, there was a nurse um, by the name of Michael Odell, and um, he's an ICU nurse and went to work Um, and halfway through his shift said he was going to go to the car and he never came back. And so he, him and his roommate, his roommate is also a nurse and they shared locations with each other. So the roommate woke up in the morning and realized that Michael hadn't come home. Hmm. And so he checked his location and found that it was, you know, somewhere down by the riverbed and, and he thought, well, that's odd. So he called work and they said, oh yeah, he, he went on a break or he went to get something out of his car and he never came back. So a few days later after that, they, you know, they, they'd been on this search. The friends created this Facebook group to try to find him. And eventually they found him a couple of days later down um, by the river. I'm not sure how, like what he did to take his own life, but um, you know, that's, that's one. And Recently, here in Santa Rosa, California, at a Kaiser facility, there was an emergency room nurse who took a loaded gun to work. This individual took uh, the gun to work and then halfway through his shift, went into a supply room and took his own life Yeah. in the emergency department. Yeah. You know, I, um, I, I, I couldn't believe it. I thought to myself... You know, there's been incidents in California, also at Long Beach Memorial, where there was a pharmacist who came to work and there was also like a shooter suicide incident there where he came in and shot um, some people there uh, in the department and then took his own life as well. Yeah. And so, you know, so many things were running through my mind when this came up and I thought, oh my gosh, I pray to God that this doesn't become something where you know, some of the employees start to get upset with their management or, you know, um, they're just feeling like they're not having the support that they need. Because in all honesty, we really don't have the support that we need when it comes to to mental health. But um, I sent a card and I also sent... um... Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry, Harry. Oh, that's wonderful. Oh man. Um I sent a card and I sent flowers to the hospital. Um, because at, from what from what happened in this ER nurses group, I posted about this incident, about the shooting. And um are you able to edit that stuff out? It's okay. fine. It's, it, okay. it adds color. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so in the ER nurses group, I posted about this individual taking his own life. Okay. And one of the nurses who actually works there said that they had no support, that they were feeling like, you know, they just had to keep on going about their shift. They didn't even, they didn't even like close, get other people to come in and take over for the nurses that were there. They just had to keep working through the day after finding out that their coworker had took his own life, which I thought was absolutely crazy. But so I, I sent some flowers and cards because 
I wanted them to see that they're not alone, that they're seen and people care. You know, and I'm, what I'm starting to realize more and more is that the change needs to come from outside of the institution, right? Not from within, which is unfortunate. Yeah. But um, that's what, you know, that was really that that really got me, Harry. I was really, really because it's my mission, and so it was something that it affected me deeply. Yeah. Honestly. You know, that's, that's something really what I've been preaching for years and really what we talk about every single week here on Medicine Revived is, um, I agree, true change has to happen at the, at the system level. And I've spoken about this much. And, uh, but until that happens, until those small incremental changes happen, we can't wait for it to happen. We have to go out and seek it out for our own personal success, our own professional success. And it will, you know, in time, there will be a change. But again, I always give the example of, you know, trying to make an aircraft carrier change directions. That's far harder to do than a speedboat who can change directions in a split second. You know, the person, the healthcare professional, be it a nurse, paramedic, firefighter, doctor, can change directions far quicker than a system can so let's focus on that. That's not dismissing the, pa- the fact that you need to change at the system level, but today, what are we going to do today that can help you become a little bit better? And that's really why I really want to have you on, Elizabeth, because I want to hear what you think. What are your thoughts on what an individual can do when they're starting to feel that sense? Like, I mean, let's use the example that you had. Let's, use, let's say there's a nurse out there or a physician out there or a nurse practitioner out there who had really just a rough day and either they don't have a supportive spouse or they just don't even know how to have that conversation with the spouse or maybe not even have that spouse. What are some things that person can do today to get them maybe just a little bit better? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and you're right. I know that um, systemically there need, does need to be a big change. And um, I believe collectively, as nurses, doctors, and and first responders, all of us doing the work on ourselves is able to help each other out, right? And so if somebody, um, the first thing I would do is find a friend that you trust, okay? Or another coworker that you trust, um, or even a leadership, somebody that you really trust and respect that you know is gonna hold the space and actually do something for you reach out to them. You know, there is EAP. And I know that sometimes EAP, they don't have the best um, people on board that maybe they might not come from the same type of background. So a lot of times you can't really connect with them, but trying to find the right counselor therapist to talk to if you're having some really difficult challenges with maybe a traumatic death that you've seen, or maybe you have, you're going through a divorce at home because things that happen at home also bleed into our work life and vice versa. So, you know, making sure that you're taking care of yourself emotionally by having somebody that you can talk to. So a friend, a therapist, uh, um, another coworker, and, and making sure that that person can hold the space for you. Because a lot of times people don't know how to hold space for you. Like my, you know, my ex-husband, we, he couldn't do that for me. He didn't know how to. And so I took that as a, oh, well, I'm just not going to tell anybody. Because if my own husband can't even hold space for me, who else is going to? And That's not the case. It, somebody definitely can. It's just that's not something he felt comfortable with. He didn't know how to talk to me about seeing a, a pediatric trauma. He didn't yeah. know how to, to. He didn't know even what how to even see that meant. Like he just could not process. So yeah. having somebody that you can um, sit with on a weekly or biweekly basis to talk about these things, I think is, is something that's important. And also, um, you know, I know that the podcast that you and I did, you had some really great pointers too about journaling. I feel like a lot of times if you can't get to somebody and talk to them, journaling your feelings out, journal in everything, you know, how you felt, what you were thinking. You know, a lot of times we have this 
feeling that, you know, we're feeling so bad about ourselves because the outcome wasn't what we wanted. And so being able to let that go that we don't always have control over the outcome. That's not up to us. So there's plenty of times where I've seen a traumatic full arrest in one accident that was the exact same. And then the other person walked away with broken bones. Yeah. We never know what's going to end up, what the outcome is. It's not up to us, even yeah. though we do all the work. You can go through all the algorithms, but um, journaling. Um, I have a really great um, morning routine as well. I know that you and I talked about that. I think when you can be really grounded, I wake up, I do yoga right away. Yeah. I do my so um, journaling and then also meditation and reading. Yeah. So that really helps me ground myself for the day. Those yeah. things are really important. And there's also something called the stress cycle. And a lot of times, if we don't close that stress cycle, we feel like that stress is still present with us. So even though we've gone through this 12 hour or 24 hour shift, and we've had all these high stressors at work, and we come home, it still doesn't feel like it's over sometimes. Yeah. And the way to get your body to realize that it's over and that you're safe. And now that time is done at the hospital or wherever you're working is to move your body. So you can do some yoga after work or some breathing exercises or journal as well. You know, you mentioned a couple of things on there that I really want to make sure we highlight for, for listeners to, to, to hear is to surround yourself with people. So you had mentioned that some a weekly, you have to speak with somebody maybe weekly. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't stress that enough. You know, what I do is, you know, we go for beers, beers and wings uh, with a couple of my close friends at work. And what we do it is we schedule it. We, we have to schedule it. It's never going to be, you know, hey man, if I get off a shift on time, I'll meet you out at, at such and such a place. It's never going to work. Um, it just doesn't. It just, it just doesn't work. You have to schedule it. We schedule it in pen. And it doesn't change uh, unless it's some kind of bananas type of emergency at, at the family level that we hold ourselves to it because we, we enjoy it. We look forward to it, but we also schedule our next one on the same day that we have our current one. So mm -hmm. we're always able to have that time to work with each other. You know, one thing that I found really helpful, Elizabeth, is, you know, to, to change uh, yourself, I think the to be of service to others has really helped me really get the change of myself that I need to be. And what I always try to do is I worry about the person to the left of me and I worry about the person to the right of me. And then what I've seen is, you know, that helps me for sure, but that also may help them as well too. And if they do the same, if they take care of the person to the left of them and to the right of them, then it just kind of goes, it kind of goes down the line. And when you start your morning shift that way, when you, you know, you worry, you know, you talk to your charge nurse and you talk to your triage nurse, you worry about the person left you in the word. And then that nurse then takes care of the other two beside him or her. And it just, the whole, by the time the shift is over, um, you guys are in a much different mindset. So I've always kind of uh, espoused that. You know, one thing that I've noticed about nurses, especially nurses, but also maybe physicians as well too, or any of us in healthcare, but especially nurses, is the, the concept of saying no. Here's a great example, Elizabeth. Here's a great example. So I was working in the ED the other day and uh, a common theme around the country and around the world is uh, short staffed. So part of it is um, a nurse had called in. So now that nurse, the current staff has to take on an extra, an extra bed, an extra, and that I find drives everybody, they, they're challenged with it. And the nurse has the trouble of saying, no, no, I won't do that. I've got two ICU patients and I get the first trauma coming in. So tell me a little bit about that. What are some strategies you can find to help, you know, how to say no, perhaps? Mm. Yeah, that is, that has always been the struggle. Yes. Nurses love to help. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I was uh, actually writing something the other day about, 
you know, if our patient needs oxygen and the oxygen tank is empty, what can we do? You know, mm -hmm. sure, we can grab a, a, ba a bag valve mask, but, you know, if it's better to give 100% oxygen, if that's what they need, as opposed to 20 room air, right? Yeah. And if, if we can't, if there's no oxygen left in the tank, how can we help other people? And so that leads into the saying no part. So if you're overwhelmed with two ICU patients and you know that that's your ratio and you taking another patient on because you don't want to say no because you feel bad, yeah. you know, what, what ends up happening when you miss those medications on the ICU patient or your patient, you know, starts to go downhill even faster because you're now worried about this other patient that you've just been given and you can't catch up on what it is you're already doing. Yeah. So the biggest thing that I've learned, and it feels very funny at first because you're not used to doing it, is you just say, no. No, that's right. <laughs> you, that's just right. Say, that's, 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 you just say no. Period. Period. Yes, and it is a complete. That you don't feel that you have to give some kind of long-winded answer. It's a no and no is a complete sentence. No. Right. And, you know, th th this is how I've done it. So if a charge nurse comes up to me and says, hey, Elizabeth, you know, um, you're going to get another run. I've, and this is exactly, I had a STEMI and a sepsis at the same time. Yeah. Okay. And then they wanted to bring me another run. And I said, listen, you are more than welcome to use that room. I know that we don't have any other rooms, but somebody else is going to have to take that patient because I am currently with STEMI and I have another patient that's in full on sepsis whose blood pressure is in the 60s. Tanking, yeah. So I will not be able to take that patient. That's all you have to say. Find somebody else. I will not be able to. And here's the thing. A lot of people say, I can't. And when, for some reason, when you say, I can't, it, somebody feels like they need to give you a pep talk after that. Well, right. sure you can. Yeah. So if you say, I will not be able to take that patient because I am with two level two acuity patients yeah. or I'm overwhelmed right now, I'm not going to be able to provide the care that I need to, then that's all you need to say. And at the end of the day, I mean, right now also what's going on is there's um, a big Redonda Vaught is a nurse who is actually being tried criminally right now mm -hmm. for a medication error. That's the other thing. You know, a lot of times all of this goes back to everything that we're talking about right now goes back to using your voice. Yeah. If people do not use their voice and stand up for themselves. They're going to put themselves in positions where they are feeling burned out at work because they're overwhelmed and they're taking on more than they should. And, and, or they're not talking to people about the things that they're feeling and becoming, you know, more stressed out and depressed and anxious about work. Yeah, you know, and, and for, the, for the listeners who are uh, watching this, because this is on YouTube as well, too, I want them to see your face when you start talking about this, because you went into coach mode, Elizabeth, <laughs> you went into coach mode. And that is what I really wanted to honor you with, because I have found the most successful people in medicine, but in outside of medicine, too, but my world is mostly in medicine, are the ones who have a coach. Although I have a coach, I know you've been coached. I know you are a coach. Um, I'm a coach as well too. And I have found that the ones who thrive the most are the ones who've been coached. And I want, and, and I'm not sure you noticed it a little bit. You kind of went into this different mode. Your face just lit up and you went into coach mode. And that's where I want to talk to lead this on, to leave us with too. Tell us a little bit about what do you find the value of coaching, especially for healthcare professionals? Tell us a little bit about what you feel you gained and you can gain as uh, coached or being coached. Mm. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much, Harry, for, for validating that. Uh -huh. I, do, I do light up. I, I, um, I didn't even notice it, but it's just, you should see it on I... YouTube. It's a completely different, <laughs> a completely different persona you went into. And I think that's fantastic. Oh, thank you. I love it. It's, it's, it's something that I've grown to love so much. And, you know, so 
to speak to your question, being coached is uh, having somebody coach you is amazing. And I'm going to tell you why. So there's a lot of times that even though, you know, we have all this knowledge, we've gone through all this training, we still have blind spots. And so somebody that that coaches with you helps you see those blind spots and they help keep you on track and keep you accountable. That's the other thing. And what I've noticed with with healthcare providers in particular, um, or and maybe this is you know across the board with people that are changing careers, they don't you know there's this fear inside of them that they're not going to be able to do it. Oh well, I've been a nurse for so many years, or you know I've been a doctor for so many years. That's all I know how to do. Well, you know, let me tell you, that's not true. All that training that you have is actually preparing you for this huge leadership role because everything we do with critical thinking, problem solving, communication, and how we um, work together in a team, I mean, you're the best leader. It shows you a true leader and a true leader really is a great coach. Yeah. And so helping, helping them understand that they can transition out of their roles, out of their roles as nurses, out of, you know, as a, as a physician into another role, uh, firefighters, police officers, a lot of times they're stuck and they feel like there's no way out. And so a coach can really help you see the way, help you pave the way, and then help you help pull you up out yeah. of there and where you want to go. You know, one thing for me that I found value in, in, in being coached and in, in coaching others as well is I think, especially for physicians, Elizabeth, um, the, the hesitation a lot of times is I don't, I don't feel, or I haven't seen that, uh, a coach is even necessary because I can tell you just even from personal experience, cause it took me a little while to get to that level to, to be coached is many of us kind of feel like, well, we're done you know, you finish residency or fellowship, whatever that may be You're like, yep, we're done now. I've reached my goal. But that was really just that was just I always tell, uh, you know, people that I work with, that's just base camp. Mm -hmm. There's still an entire mountain ahead of you. And mm -hmm. I think for physicians, especially, for, especially for physicians is you kind of just kind of you, you're, I can only tell you from personal experience. And again, from the people who I have, I worked with as well. I've been wanting to become a physician since I was in freshman year in high school. So my focus and my goal and my long-term vision was to reach that level. I never thought about the next chapter after that. I was only focused on becoming a physician. And once I got there, it was fantastic. Mm -hmm. But that was just base camp for me. And that's where I think many physicians lie and that's why I think so many physicians, and especially many of us in health, you know, healthcare professionals, not just physicians, you kind of reach that level, and then you never thought to yourself, I got to look a little bit farther. I got to, I got to see around this corner because that's all you are focused on. And then you get there, and you got to do the thing, do the thing that you're trained to do. Mm -hmm. But then you start saying to yourself, I kind of wanted to do this as well, or I, I'm kind of interested in this, or I'm kind of interested in a little bit of leadership, or I'm kind of interested in doing education, or I'm tr interested in uh, educating the next generation. Or you may even say like, I don't even want to do medicine anymore, you know, but you've reached that goal. And then you, and then you kind of get there like, okay, now I'm done. And coaching Elizabeth has really kind of tells you, well, there's more. There's so much more in you. You've got that fire in you and there's so much more for you. So coach can really draw that out from you. Mm -hmm. Not number one, it, you know, you, when your first couple of meetings with your coach, even your first probably six months, probably with a coach, a good coach, at least was going to actually kind of help you really kind of nail down really what are your goals? What are your, what is your long-term vision? And then after that, it's keeping you on that road not doing the work for you. That's your job. Your mm -hmm. coach is going to help you give you the roadmap and keep you accountable to that dream that you've set out for yourself. And I know that's what you do for your clients as well, um, Elizabeth. And re really, I want, I want more. If, if, it, if it be my life's vision for us in healthcare and for Medicine Revived and for you and your clients and for those of uh, those of us in healthcare listening to this is seek coaches out. They're there for a reason and 
They're there to help you and help you see around the corners and see you help you see past base camp. So, so with that, Elizabeth, tell us how, how can we, especially if you're a nurse or a nurse practitioner, for example, or a CRNA, if you're interested in coaching, tell us how we can find you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I just, I love what you're doing, Harry. I just need to, I just need to throw that out there. That oh, I, I appreciate that. Thank uh, you. Yeah, of course. It's, um, and what you're saying is absolutely true. Everybody, you know, having somebody to on this journey with you is, is amazing. It can help you get so much farther, faster Yeah. and see, and you're able, your eyes are open to much more possibilities than you can see even in front of yourself. So definitely. And so I am all over social media. You can find me on Facebook at Elizabeth Cantu. You can find me on Instagram, Elizabeth A. Cantu. And then I'm on LinkedIn, Elizabeth Cantu. And my website is invida, I-N-V-I-D-A, coaching.com. I think that is. And, oh, and I forgot the podcast. And I have a podcast. It's I was emergency. just going to say, I was on it. You should totally <laughs> listen to it, everybody. <laughs> yeah. the emergency Network Podcast is the podcast. And it's a wonderful, mm -hmm. wonderful podcast. Um, so yeah, so exactly. And again, if you're on your morning run, your morning walk, um, or if you're in the car, those links will be in the show notes that accompanies this show as well. So Elizabeth, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for the work that you're doing. And especially for the work that you're doing, especially for the, uh, our nurses, they've really been uh, challenged over the past uh, several years for sure. Um, and, you know, I always kind of kill with my nurses too, quite honestly, I spend most of my day, I tell them right behind a computer, I just put the stuff in the computer and then it just kind of magically happens. I just come back and like, oh, the thing is happening. And I figure there are elves working here, but they're not. It's just the, the hardworking nurses that I have and I'm blessed to have them because there's no way any of us can do our jobs without the, the fantastic support of, of, of nursing. So thank you so much for what you're doing. And again, as I said, for our listeners, I can make sure you, uh, Go, go to the show, long, the show notes and the links will be in the show notes. So Elizabeth, thank you so much. A wonderful time as always. And uh, I hope you're doing, have a wonderful week and uh, we'll talk again soon.